Okay guys, a very warm welcome to what's going to be a fairly truncated um, and ultimately uh, a second session in our series on genocide. Um, I suppose I wanted to start this recording uh, with an apology uh, and as much as possible an explanation. Um, it's been a, as you might be able to tell from uh, my visual aesthetic, things are a little, I mean I'm always fairly hairy, uh, but I'm hairier and a little bit sleep deprived. It's, it's not been the um, not been the easiest sort of two, three weeks. Um, and, you know, I I mainly want to apologize that, that it impacts on you guys. You know, it's it's, it's compromising your time. Um, uh, and so I'm sorry for that. Um, I, I, I wish there was um, uh, an easy fix uh, that would give me this time back. But I think that like the, the shorthand version is there isn't. And you know, there may well be a time um, when I think we as a family are, are comfortable going into uh, sort of the specifics of, of why I've been uh, sort of by circumstance withheld from you guys. Um, I don't think we're there. I don't think we're going to be there like this calendar year, academic year. I don't know. At, at some point, we'll be comfortable going into it. Um, but I, I suppose I wanted to reassure you that it's 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 only in. Um, what have been some very extreme circumstances um, that I would not be able to be with you in person. Um, so again, uh, I hope you accept the apologies. Um, uh, and again, I sort of apologise that this will be a, a truncated second session. I, I'm, I'm all wanting to give you some some case studies and ideas to be thinking about um, before we meet uh, next week. And, and what I'm really hoping is that as we get into what is practically speaking our third session um, that I'll be at least in a position to deliver it um, live online I'll be I'll be here um, in my little research center um, but the, the idea is that I'll be delivering it um, live over the course of maybe not quite the the three hour session it's, it's quite a long session for me to be sat in here in front of a camera um, but you know, we'll, we'll have a, a significantly greater period of contact time for week three. And if all goes well, um, sort of the last formal um, uh, session before uh, you guys take over for, for the last session of the year, um, all being well, um, I'll be with you in person. So, so let's keep fingers crossed. Let's hope that circumstances are a little bit uh, kinder, a little bit more forgiving, um, and I can be with you uh, in person. Um, for the most part, this video will be my audio over the slides that I will be sharing with you, or at least some of the slides that I plan to share with you. Um, I'll stay on camera for the moment, um, just so I can sort of introduce what it was that I wanted to be talking about um, in our second session. Now, the the second session in our tranche of four, looking at genocide, um, was was I think it was titled "Methods um, of Mass Murder." So it's thinking about. Uh, the sort of the mechanisms um, of genocide. Now, that's not to say that what I wanted to do with that session was think about the, the sort of the various and creative ways in which humans have found to kill other humans. Um, it's, it's, it's not quite so literal in that sense. What I'm more interested in looking at in this session is I think some of the, the sort of the psychological measures that are taken, some of the ways in which people are prepared um, to engage in the process of genocide, um, and also think uh, a little bit broader about some of those circumstances that lead us to genocide. Um, where we left things last time, so just over a couple of weeks ago, um, I had been wanting to talk a little bit about Australia, and that's where I'm going to pick things up um, in this recording. Um, Australia um, sees what can be presented as genocide um, take place because of a, a, a number of factors that aren't necessarily critically rooted um, in a desire to remove um, a people or a culture, that there are other factors at play that lead to what we've already begun to talk about as um, incidental or perhaps non-deliberate genocide. Now, of course, in the Australian instance, um, there was plenty of deliberate acts of violence. Whether there was a desire to move towards eradication, that's perhaps something that's more questionable. It's certainly something that we can debate. Um, 
And as we move through the period of colonialism in an Australian setting, there are certainly some voices that I think move to that point um, where they are open to the idea um, of complete eradication. Uh, and we'll show you some examples of that. Um, but I think what we're more dealing with is, is circumstantial driven genocide that because of the goals and objectives of a people moving into a territory or space or a nation um, we are we're dealing with circumstances that that facilitate or perhaps demand genocide it's not necessarily the objective and so when we look at the holocaust next week um, one of the questions that we'll be asking um, is is the holocaust unique or or indeed what makes the Holocaust unique or distinct from other forms of genocide. And certainly in that instance, we're dealing with a very deliberate genocide. There are some scholars who have argued that um, the period of Nazi rule uh, in Germany and across other territories where Nazism was installed as the voice of political power. Um, there are some academics who argue that the Holocaust and the pursuit of the eradication of Jewish people was the thing that truly um, distinguishes and, and, and identifies um, the Nazi agenda of that time, that the spread of National Socialism was perhaps a secondary concern to the eradication of the Jewish people. Now, I stress, some academics argue this, others argue the opposite, and I, I get from a personal perspective I find it slightly flawed um, to present an argument that Nazism uh, wasn't concerned overly with the spread of National Socialism. I, I, I think that was quite an overt point of concern. Um, but sort of snapping very closely on the heels of that objective um, was not was a desire to eradicate the Jewish people. And, and we, we see some very uh, proactive measures taken um, under Nazi uh, governorship, uh, Nazi leadership, um, to realise those objectives. Um, so at, at the very least we have uh, an example there where the eradication of people or peoples was the clear, or was a clear, uh, primary objective. That, that was the end goal. That's not consistent when we're dealing with genocide. Um, and we will look at examples um, where again I introduced the idea in week one of incidental uh, genocide or at least or at least genocide being a sort of a secondary um, consequence of other objectives. So these are some of the ideas that I want to explore. Where I'm going to take this uh, session uh, in terms of evolution is to ultimately take us to a point of considering the other. Um, and I think appreciating the importance um, uh, from a sort of a, a philosophical standpoint of the other, um, I should be doing this, the other, um, is a profound importance in terms of understanding genocide or indeed mass murder in, in a more general sense. Um, othering is a process that allows, at least in part, allows genocide to happen. It is the process of conditioning people to accept a narrative, believe wholeheartedly in a narrative, or indeed be willing to uh, suspend or, or push back what might be uh, an innate desire to oppose the treatment of a certain people, um, based on the grounds of what makes uh, a person, uh, a collective, or indeed a nation, uh, distinct, separate, uh, the other, the sort of the manifestation of the other. Um, it's something that's going to be really important to understand as we go into our session on the Holocaust. Um, and the last session that we'll do where we, where we consider um, the role of modernity um, in genocide as a process, um, we will look again at where othering and the process of identifying or indeed creating the other feeds into that. But it, it is a profound significance. In a sense, we touched on it um, in the one session that we did have face-to-face, uh, -face, um, where we talked a little bit about um, the importance of different cultures. And I'll, I'll talk about that again in this session as well. 
Um, just sort of highlighting that you don't need much to hang a narrative of other uh, upon. Um, I've sort of introduced the idea of othering in terms of the notion of cultural genocide, and it, that is something that I want to um, make mention of uh, in this session when we sort of formally get into it uh, a little bit later on. Um, we talked about cultural genocide uh, in relation to both Ireland and Wales when we're talking about language. Um, and the eradication of language, the manifestation of a culture, the notion being that if you eradicate a culture, you eradicate a people. Introducing the idea that you don't need to kill people to enact genocide. The genocide can uh, be manifest in other forms of uh, destruction or eradication. Um, so we introduce that idea, but I want to take that a little bit further today and think about some of the broader ways in which othering takes place. Think about how that's manifest, but critically understand where othering fits into the process of nationalism. Um, and, you know, I only want to talk about nationalism to a certain extent in this module, largely because there is a second year module that focuses almost exclusively on the emergence of nationalism in the sort of the, the latter part of the 18th century moving throughout the 19th century. So we, we do deal with that in a specific module. So I'm only going to talk so much about it. Um, but othering is a profoundly important part of nationalism, of nation building. Um, and so understanding where these things sit together is of, I think, of quite profound importance. Because of course, so much of what we would recognize and identify as genocide is taking place in a 19th and a 20th century context. One of the things we want to do with this set of sessions is establish the idea that, that genocide is something that is distinct from mass murders that take place in earlier periods of history. I think in week one we introduced the idea um, that you have the hallmarks, the traits of genocide occurring in other periods of history. And you know, we talked about Carthage and the destruction of Carthage and thinking about that as genocide. And again, I don't think we necessarily um, definitively concluded that what happened in Carthage was an act of genocide, but there were various traits of genocide that were manifest in that destruction. Um, and we looked at about some of the motivations behind that destruction as well. But I think our argument is that genocide in, in a recognisable, distinct cultural form is something that is far more um, easy or practical to identify in a 19th, 20th century context. And one of the questions we, we are going to ask is why? What is it about that period of history that makes it viable to, to, to present an argument, uh, if you will, that genocide is distinct uh, and grounded historically in those particular periods. Um, I would contest that the emergence of nationalism is a hugely important contributor to that process. Nationalism is sort of the, the, the real point at which um, cultural entities bounded by territory begin looking at each other and saying you're different for this reason, for that reason, and for those reasons we're happy to go to war with you. We are indeed happy to die defending our bit of territory and what we think of as being important in terms of our identity, our cultural traits, in defence of or defiance towards your cultural traits, the things that make you distinct, special, and whatever it might be. Um, that appreciation combined with the emergence of the mechanisms of modernity, what modernity affords nations in that process of both nation building, but also that process of othering, I would contest leads us to a point where genocide is, and this is perhaps where I'm gonna be uh, pushing the boundaries of this module. I'm gonna make the argument that the combination, nationalism, othering, the mechanisms of modernity, that mass form of communication, if nothing else, makes genocide an inevitability of modernity. And that's quite a bold statement to be making, 
Um, and I'm not saying it's a definitive argument, uh, but it's certainly the one that I'm going to be proposing to you. Uh, and it'd be interesting to see what your reflections are. Maybe not so much after this session, but maybe two, three weeks from now when we have our final debate session, uh, hopefully in class together, um, we can revisit that question and get your thoughts on that. But on that, I'm going to stop on camera. And for I think for the, the, the bulk of what I do from this point on, I'm going to be narrating over the slides. Um, I'll, I'll introduce a couple of sort of stopping points uh, where we might take the opportunity to discuss some themes and I'll set up a, a forum via Moodle where if you are so motivated or compelled we can discuss things further in that setting. Um, but yeah, um, many thanks for joining me uh, for this video uh, on the premise that you are joining me. Um, if not, tell your friends, tell your friends to come along because um, uh, this is taking a, a fair bit of conviction and willpower to, 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 st to sit myself in front of the camera and um, talk to you guys uh, in these circumstances. So. Um, yeah, many thanks. Uh, and I'm going to pause a moment, switch over to um, the slides, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about Australia uh, in the next part of this video. Okay. Okay, guys, so this is where I wanted to formally start uh, the second session. Um, and this is the title of the session, Mechanisms of Mass Murder. So just again, qualifying that we're not talking about the practical ways in which people are killing each other, but thinking more about the ways in which people are conditioned um, to accept genocide as uh, something viable, something uh, worth pursuing, or something that is acceptable pursuing in uh, the very specific contexts uh, that we see it take place. Where we left things off was just leading into a discussion on um, Australia. Uh, I, I wanted to use it as a case study. Um, because it, it presents a number of interesting um, ways of looking at genocide in the sense that we can see both those who are motivated to destroy uh, a people, um, to, to eradicate a, a indigenous population on the grounds of what we might begin to think about as eugenics. Um, but we also have a practical uh, aspect to the landscape as well. I mean, I, I wanted to give you um, this one quote uh, from Dadrien, um, where, where he writes uh, he writes this on genocide, that the successful attempt by a dominant group vested with formal authority and or with preponderant access to the overall resources of power to reduce by coercion or lethal violence the number of a minority group whose ultimate extermination is held desirable and useful and whose respective vulnerability is a major factor contributing to the decision of genocide. Now there are lots of interesting things to unpack uh, from this particular quotation and I think one of the most important ones is this idea that genocide is a decision. There's almost a notion being put forward here that there is a conscious mechanism at place that that says that the perpetrators of these crimes are conscious of them. They are willing to participate in them because they know that it is taking place. Now, I'm going to give you lots of quotations and point in the direction of lots of scholarship on genocide, which is not necessarily consistent with the rest of uh, the literature on genocide. This is a subject which, relatively speaking, is in its academic infancy. Um, the, the, there are plenty of uh, sort of treaties on genocide, but but by sort of comparison to other um, philosophical interpretations on the human experience, we haven't necessarily been talking about genocide for that long. And I suppose one of the reasons for that is, for many scholars on the subject, genocide is uh, a cultural practice that is grounded in in a much more recent period of history. You know, we have introduced uh, a number of different case studies uh, where we've looked at historical and prehistorical contexts where we might be able to point to traits of genocide emerging. Um, but for many, the argument about genocide is something that is rooted in the 19th century and as we move into the 20th century. Um, and indeed, we, we go back to that provocative line that I'm pitching towards you, that genocide is a product of modernity, that, that, that it is something that 
um, emerges out of and is a consequence of many of the changes that we associate with modernity and that particular period of history. So I do think it's interesting to think of uh, genocide as, as being a, a conscious decision. And I would contest it in the sense that there, there, are, there are plenty of examples where um, active genocide is something that we, we can it's quite, quite comfortably um, source. And of course the Holocaust is a striking example of that, where you have a very clear set of decisions that are being made which result in the Holocaust. That this, this is an objective of a series of, of, a, of a community of uh, people. However, I've also introduced the idea already of genocide as incidental or accidental, that it's not necessarily the primary objective to destroy life on a grand scale, that there are other, perhaps more practically driven motivations that result in genocide. The genocide is the consequence of what is taking place. And in this particular quote, we, we, we have this sort of qualification stress there, um, whose ultimate extermination is held desirable and useful. The suggestion here being that there is some sort of practical, tangible benefit uh, to be um, sourced, identified, perceived um, by the eradication of what is more often than not a minority group. Um, we might think back to the Holocaust or think forwards to the Holocaust in terms of looking at it next week and ask what was the useful component of the Holocaust. And I suppose we can point to uh, probably lots of small, relatively speaking, minor, practical, useful consequences of the Holocaust. At the same time, the overarching motivation there was the eradication of a cultural group. Now, is that useful? Well, I suppose it could be deemed useful if you have been conditioned to the point that you believe the mere existence of a cultural group which is not aligned to your philosophy, your belief system, uh, your race, that if you're conditioned to believe something negative about that group of people, then you are probably in a position to be cultured to believe that the eradication of those people is, by definition, useful. Their, the, the termination of their existence, the, the cessation of the continuation of their cultural uh, means of expression safeguards yours. That's that you are somehow safer, you are preserved, your future well-being and viability is secured by the removal of those other people. And so in that instance, where we might not necessarily have a rational, tangible way of identifying a use value to genocide, if we think about it from the perspective of culturing and conditioning, we may well yet find a use. It's not necessarily rational, but we may find an irrational belief in the usefulness of genocide. I think with Australia, um, and in particular in that early colonial period, I think we find ourselves looking at a cultural landscape in which um, we find both factors at play. I think towards the end of the process, essentially we see that system of eugenics uh, taking hold um, and leaving us with uh, a scenario in which there is a dominant Western white narrative which believes that the indigenous population of Australia um, is inherently negative, that there are solid uh, cultural uh, education-based grounds um, which argue that the eradication of these people benefits the rest of the population because these people are backward, they are negative, they are um, uncivilised. The, 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 this, this ranch of, of um, negative value-based attributions being introduced into the discussion is not necessarily rational, it is an irrational uh, set of eugenics based uh, considerations um, which allow you to conclude that the removal of these people is a positive thing. 
At the same time, I would contest that the incidental genocide that we see in Australia is perhaps more more clearly rooted um, in these practical, uh, useful aspects of um, of modern society, if you like, where we start dealing with the clearance of land, the acquisition of territory, the growth of industry. These are all trappings of modernity. These are not things that we can, in any sort of comfortable, practical way, cite pre-modernity. These are traits of the process and mechanisms of modernity. And we will see in, in an Australian context how these ultimately become manifest in what we can describe as a process of genocide. Um, now, Australia, of course, has um, a, a fairly a protracted history in relation to um, uh, social engagement uh, between different peoples, uh, sometimes hostile, uh, sometimes uh, a little less so in terms of um, uh, preoccupation and objective. We're of course dealing with a narrative that is rooted in sort of the latter part of the 18th century and running through much of the 19th. And of course, you, you may all want to argue that this is something that runs on well into the 20th and indeed 21st century in terms of the cultural legacy of um, difficult social relations between a, a incoming white Western set of uh, political uh, and cultural values um, offset by a native Aboriginal uh, culture which is far more driven uh, by relationships with the land, seasonality, mobility, the sort of the permanence that we associate with um, uh, a Western European world isn't necessarily applicable in the same sense. So you, you're dealing with um, cultural groups that have two uh, profoundly different uh, sets of um, objectives uh, and priorities in terms of their day-to-day. It is worth stressing, however, that whilst there is initial tension uh, between an incoming uh, Western uh, British um, uh, uh, cultural and political uh, migration uh, into Australia, that's that's not the whole narrative. I mean, if we look to um, say, the, the, if we go to like the 1780s, um, I think move it on a little bit from Cook. Uh, to figures like um, uh, Arthur Phillip, uh, one of the other captains who comes along uh, a little bit later on. The, there's one really important quote um, that we have in relation to his visitation um, uh, on, on the arrival of his fleet into Australia, um, where he was compelled, uh, and, and this is the quote that, that, that was sort of guiding Phillip's uh, initial actions in Australia, that by every possible means, to open an intercourse with the natives uh, and to conciliate their affections, which would ultimately allow both communities to live in amity and kindness. Yeah? There was actually efforts made to safeguard the native population of Australia by some of those responsible for the British migration into this new territory. Now, again, let's not get too wild with that point of consideration. That is, of course, not representative of the broader historical narrative. It's just an important footnote um, to add into our considerations that arguably the early part of the colonization of Australia, in, that, in particular that, that late window of the 18th century, is not obsessed with a narrative of replacement, of clearance, of indeed genocide. I think you have some who are, within, within the British political landscape, some who are quite genuinely motivated to maintain a positive relationship between the two. But I think where things are pushed um, in relation to that dynamic um, is another manifestation of the modern world, and that's population pressure. Um, for a number of different factors, Australia becomes increasingly attractive um, to uh, British political forces. Um, so, you know, we're talking about the 1780s as a period where expansion of British interest in Australia is taking place with this caveat that 
there should be a positive relationship with a native uh, Aboriginal population. Okay, that's our starting point. However, at roughly the same time, on the other half, uh, sort of on the other side of the planet, there are the American Wars of Independence rumbling out. And of course, the, 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 the shorthand version of the American War of Independence is British authority is kicked out of, um, uh, out of what becomes the United States. Now, whilst there are lots of consequences for that, one of the most profound ones in terms of the movement of British peoples was North America had been a place where deportation of criminals had been taking place. We, we probably have a more um, overtly familiar narrative uh, in relation to deportation of criminals uh, from Britain to Australia. Um, and you know that's, that, that's sort of a, a point of cultural mockery today in relation to the population of Australia. Um, however, the practice of deportation of, of convicts um, from Britain to other territories uh, initially started with uh, the African continent uh, and then focused on the North American continent. When the North American door was shut, the shift in emphasis moves to Australia. So there is a direct correlation between the spike in the numbers of convicts being relocated to Australia from Britain and the American War of Independence. So as a consequence of the American War of Independence, it is now desirable to take more territory in Australia. And so suddenly the political landscape is shifting. So there's a little less emphasis on safeguarding the Aboriginal communities and making sure that their displacement is not excessive when the needs of the British state change, or at least the circumstances of the British state change. And as we push into the 19th century, um, suddenly initially there's a greater demand of space in terms of convicts. Now always remember with convicts being uh, relocated to Australia, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily a case of imprisoning people. Of course that's where the process starts and hard labour in Australian prison camps is something that is the experience for many who are deported to Australia. Yet for many, um, the actual process of deportation was the point that was seen as punishment. You know, you're being taken to a completely foreign uh, territory, you're removed from family, friends, the familiarity of your cultural landscape, um, and in a sense you're sort of being cast out and left to fend for yourself. Excuse me, I have no idea what that sound is. I'm going to pause the recording a second and figure out what the hell that noise is. Okay, apologies for the intrusion. I think that sound, um, that I don't know if it's being picked up on the mic, but I can certainly hear it. I can't hear much else other than that, um, is I believe some muck spreading going on from the farms nearby. Not the ideal, uh, but there we go. So it, uh, it now stinks up here, um, but I will carry on because you know, we, we, we're not running this as a scratch and sniff session. So uh, just imagine that the room that I'm sitting in is now uh, a wash with the smell of manure. Um, which, in, in a sense, almost sort of links us round to uh, the point that I was going to discuss, um, which was agriculture. Okay, so I've really introduced the idea that the prison population is expanding in relation to the American War of Independence. We've got that, we're settled, uh, we can move on. In terms of what was happening to those prisoners uh, and convicts, um, for those not necessarily uh, committed to hard labour or those who had completed their term of hard labour, they were then being sort of cast out into the Australian landscape. And it was an exercise in sort of fending for yourself. Um, many people who were transported uh, were then stuck in Australia. There wasn't necessarily the, the financial means to secure passage to get back to Britain. It wasn't that it was prohibited, it was just financially prohibitive to return back to what was known as home. So you had a lot of the prison population settling in Australia um, and looking to carve out a home. Uh, now of course you need to be able to sustain that home and that sustainability demands things like farming. So we see not just an expansion of the uh, white western population in Australia, 
but we also see an expansion in terms of their presence in the landscape. So we see um, clearance of land, we see farms being established, we see uh, new structures being introduced, and there is a degree of, of, of relationship between the incoming and the native um, Aboriginal population. Um, however, there is this, I've already talked about it, this process of incidental genocide, that we are seeing the native population of Australia being decimated through indirect measures. So there is conflict. Let's, let's, let's not skirt around that. There is violent conflict between settling farmers uh, and those peoples uh, those people who would have called that landscape their home would have had traditional routeways through the landscape that are now being introduced and compromised uh, by the presence of private farmsteads, uh, barriers, territorial boundaries manifest through fences and lines, um, stock fencing, for instance, things that were completely alien to that landscape before. So you still have uh, an Aboriginal population that is trying to pursue their traditional ways of life, their traditional pathways through the landscape. And that creates conflict and tension between a Western population that has very different ideas about privacy, about ownership of land, about bounded territory. And so, yeah, there is violent conflict between the two. But then we also have the problem of the distribution of clothing from Western settlers offered to the native population. Clothing that may have been infested with lice, mites, that may have been harbouring diseases that the native population had no natural immunity to. We also see issues in relation to the virulent spread of sexually transmitted diseases um, being introduced by the white western migrating community. It's clearly evidence of interpersonal relations between that migrant population and the native population. But again, there's no natural immunity. These are people being exposed to diseases that they have never experienced before. We are, might also talk about things like alcoholism, with the expansion of Western interest become, uh, sort of hot in the wake of it, become the spread of Western indulgence. And so alcoholism, something that was not uh, particularly prevalent or manifest amongst Aboriginal communities prior to the expansion of Western interest in this particular territory now becomes prevalent. And so we see alcoholism, uh, sexual disease, uh, and exposure to more uh, viral-based conditions decimating populations. Now, was that the intention uh, of the incoming British force? You might be able to make an argument that says yes, but on balance, I think you would be inclined to say no. It wasn't necessarily an objective to condemn the Aboriginal population to widespread alcoholism, to the uh, hugely damaging effects of syphilis, to uh, viral um, uh, death on a large scale. But these are consequences of the expansion of British interests within that territory. So if, we, if we're talking about large-scale loss of life um, through indirect measures, but accepting that as part of a genocidal process, uh, then we can start pointing to that, that mechanism playing out here. So again, this is what I'm talking about in terms of mechanisms uh, and methods of mass murder. It's not necessarily the objective of the Western um, uh, settlers from an initial standpoint to eradicate these peoples, but certainly as a consequence of their actions, what they're bringing with them and what they are exposing people to, a process that in any other set of circumstances of genocide, sorry, a process in which any other set of circumstances we would describe as genocide, that being large-scale loss of life, a loss of culture, uh, and the notional benefits being derived from that by the people coming in. Because, of course, if your native population is being decimated, well, that's practically speaking opening up more land. Yep, It, it allows you to expand your territory even further. And as you do that, you exacerbate the situation further. You push further into Aboriginal territory. 
by doing that, you increase your level of interaction with and exposure to the native population. In so doing, you trade with them, you're giving them access to uh, goods that may be tainted, you may be introducing people to sexual diseases, alcoholism, all these things that ultimately contribute to the massive loss of life in relation to that native population. And so, in a very practical sense, uh, we might say genocide is taking place. When it comes to practical desire, um, Tony Barta uh, comes up with this with, with this wonderfully uncomfortable quote, where he he writes that sheep might seem unlikely instruments of genocide, and yet in the context of Australia, it is exactly what is taking place. At the same time as colonial interests in Australia expand exponentially, we also see um, an increase in the importance um, of um, the wool industry back in a British context. So that sort of that industrial expansion, the growth of woolen mills, for instance, um, is, a, is a very real active process. Um, in an, uh, sorry, in, in a British setting. And again, that is modernity once more. It's mass industry. You know, the woolen industry had, had, had always been there. You know, you, you, you can cast this into prehistory. You know, people are farming sheep for their wool to make clothing as far back as the Neolithic. So you know, take this, what, four, five, six thousand years ago. This is not a new process, but what modernity affords is an exponential increase in the capacity to grow that trade, to introduce efficiencies, to increase the scale of the product. That's where modernity is kicking in. It's creating both the mass market, but also the mechanism by which you can feed that mass market. And that is where Australia fits into the narrative. So with a greater emphasis on the importance of wool and sheep farming comes a correlating uh, emphasis on the need for grazing land. Um, in relation to grazing, you have bounded territory. So fencing, uh, partitioning of land, clear divisions established in the landscape, which was previously open plains, open landscapes, free for migration for anyone, anywhere, at any time. As we're sort of moving into the 1820s and 1830s, you get real pitched conflict between a settler migration population and a indigenous Aboriginal population. The tension is over that classic issue of rights to land, right to rights to access traditional territories for whatever reason. And you know, there's a similar narrative going on in a British setting in the same sense where um, rights to uh, graze animals on common pasture um, is coming under pressure. Although this is probably more an issue of the, the sort of the, the, the century before in a British context, but a very similar narrative uh, playing out there. This is where we really see an emphasis on the relative cost of life and the life of your aboriginal male female child is marked very low it, it's, it's lower than the life of a sheep it's lower than the value of grazing land and there are clear efforts to protect that territory and this is where you start seeing very clear-cut incidents of massacre mass instances of loss of life. And th this is predominantly from the perspective of white westerner versus indigenous aboriginal population. Very rarely is there loss of life going in the opposite direction. So um, this, this notion of sheep being an instrument of genocide, again, this is not direct, but the indirect narrative is un, um, undeniable. It, it, it's a very clear part of the process. So you have this combination of factors. You have the emphasis on agriculture, the way that changes land, uh, or more in particular, the way in which that changes land use and the conflict that creates. That's coupled with all of these factors that we've already discussed, uh, diet, uh, disease, um, alcoholism, uh, 
Uh, clothing and housing, I mean, things like this, the, the, the introduction of what we might describe as a more familiar Western form of housing, as opposed to um, the more temporary mobile form of structures that had been the norm before, um, does have an impact. And, you know, poor housing uh, introduces things like damp. Uh, poor housing uh, allows for vermin to congregate and focus and spread disease within those new structures. And combined with all of these factors, um, we also have uh, the critically important uh, point, the, the sixth point on this list of depression, of mental health being negatively impacted upon by the changes that are being monitored. And this has an associate impact in terms of levels of suicide, um, impacts on general sense of well-being, motivation. Um, all of these seem to fall off dramatically. And of course, this is tied to loss of tradition, loss of territory, loss of family in many instances. You know, the, the image that we have here on the right hand side, um, this, this collection of armed, well-dressed white men uh, wandering around New South Wales and coming across the female native, yes? Um, it's this sort of narrative of imbalance. And a little bit earlier on, I mean, if we just go back, um, if we just go back here, um, the successful attempt by a dominant group vested with formal authority and or with preponderant access to the overall resources of power. If we go back to this image, you have very clear indications of power. There is, if I jump around again, a dominant group. Dominant group vested with authority. Who's vested them with authority? Well, they're vested themselves with authority. And they've backed it up with the weaponry that gives them a tactical advantage. You have the core components that lead to a climate in which genocide can take place. And then when you have all these factors coming together, and you have those factors playing out for decades, then this happens. As we get through to the 1840s and the 1850s, we see commentary like this coming from um, uh, newspaper uh, publications in Australia. Uh, and the sort of illustrations that we see um, accompany it um, on the right-hand side as well. This editorial, in part, reads as such we unhesitatingly repeat and this emphasis we unhesitatingly repeat that the perpetuation of the race of aborigines is not to be desired they are an inferior race of human beings it is vain to deny and it is no more desirable that any inferior race should be perpetuated than that the transmission of a hereditary disease scrofula or insanity should be encouraged. There we have eugenics. There we have this narrative of inferior races being exterminated for the greater good. And again, I apologize for jumping around, but I really want to emphasize this point. We talked about this earlier. A number of a minority group whose ultimate extermination is held desirable and useful. And where does that pump these points come together here it is desirable that an inferior race should be exterminated removed and why well it strengthens the human experience seemingly if these inferior strands of the human race are eradicated there's a means by which people convince themselves of the merits of acts of genocide or at the very least acts of mass murder now, I stress the dates are important. You know, we've looked at uh, a sort of a 50-year period. First contact, coming towards the end of the 18th century, a point in which the figures who are sort of acting as proto-governors for Australia, or parts of Australia at least, are being encouraged to get good relations with the native population. Within a couple of decades of that, the native population are being hunted down and killed because they are a threat or at least are deemed a threat to the importance of farming territory for the white settler. And within another 20 years of that we have newspaper articles legitimizing a process of eugenics 
and extermination. And the time scale around that is remarkably brief. And you might recall in the first session we talked about the impact um, of generational loss on things like language. How quickly does it take uh, a language or a culture to disappear? How many uh, generations of interruption must there be before a culture is lost? And I pitched you only need one moment of interruption. How many generations of exposure do you need to a narrative of one particular group of people who live nearby you are inferior and you're better off if they're removed? How many times do you have to hear that? How many generations have to be exposed to that narrative until it becomes the norm, it becomes accepted and it becomes something that newspaper editors can happily stick in their main newspapers and say this is a good thing for the people of this country for us to eradicate another race of humans. The evidence would say not that much. Two, maybe three generations at most is all you need to indoctrinate a people into believing that this is a path that is righteous and for the benefit of the many. At the cost of the few. Is that in any way justifiable? If we just cast this in a wider context once more, 1928. 1928 was the last time that we see not just a, an act of police, Australian police shooting Aborigines in Australia, but the last case where it is justified that the act of killing Aborigines on the grounds of self-defense, in, in this instance, the narrative was tied to farming. It was uh, a question of uh, access uh, to, to land rights, I think. Um, and here, a narrative of self-defense is pitched and it's accepted. The police are allowed to just walk away from gunning down Aboriginal Australians. 1928, so 60, 70 years on from a point at which newspaper editors are saying, we're better off if these people are exterminated. And still 70 years later, you have police getting away scot-free from what are later seen as acts of murder. It's remarkable, really. Um, so, with that fairly bleak narrative in mind for the evolution of attitudes towards genocidal acts in Australia, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's worth reflecting on questions like this again. You know, I, I would always ask you to, you know, pause the recording, spend a little bit of time thinking about you know, one of our key questions that runs throughout this module, and that is to define genocide. And here we're not just thinking about the act itself, but thinking about how do we identify it? What are the pointers that, that lead us to predicting an act of genocide? In the Australian setting, you're dealing with an external force coming into a native landscape and forcing change. Enacting change for economic purposes, and I suppose penal purposes as well, but, but really the, the, the core change, I think, in an Australian setting is tied to um, agriculture and, and, and pastoralism, uh, far more than it is to do with the treatment of um, uh, convicts and exported criminals. Um, of course, the, these things tie together, um, but the, the movement of convicts doesn't have to result in the emphasis on agriculture. That emphasis is coming from something that's happening in a British setting and critically tied to modernity. And again, if we just look at the time scale of some of the examples in this uh, satire, um, again, th there's a certain conflation. All of this is focusing on 20th and early 21st century and highlighting you know, the, 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 the sort of the glib narrative that lessons are, are never learned from Holocaust, that, 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 or so, that, sorry, that are never learned from genocide, that they keep on being replicated uh, again and again. But do think, when we're considering what is genocide, where does it start? What are the mechanisms that don't just lead to, but critically allow for genocide to take place? And there's a point that we'll keep revisiting, uh, certainly in the next two sessions as well.
If we turn attention to the Rwandan genocide that took place in 1994, we might feel like we're dealing with uh, an episode in genocidal history that seems a little bit more straightforward. Um, we are, of course, dealing with a narrative that focuses on um, divisions between uh, the Hutu and the Tutsi uh, population. In, in, pr predominantly in Rwanda, but we're also dealing with uh, a, a narrative that impacts on Burundi um, as well. And it's perhaps worth noting that you have genocidal conflict going in both directions um, in the history of Burundi, if you trace it back to the 1980s as well as the 1990s. Um, then you're having e extreme episodes of mass killings uh, in both directions. But the more common narrative that we're familiar with um, is the genocide of the Tutsi, uh, population uh, within Rwanda. <sighs> Difficult to say exactly what the sort of the, the 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 number of victims are given the 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 scale uh, and the appetite uh, for killings that took place during this period um, in ninety four. Um, estimates put it sort of between five hundred and eight hundred thousand deaths. Um, when you fold in deaths of non-Tutsi victims, that is to say, um, in particular, uh, there were a, a significant number of um, Hutu um, people within Rwanda who opposed the genocide that was taking place that looked to shelter or protect Tutsis, um, and, and they were subject to uh, execution uh, and murder um, as well. So the, the actual total population uh, who lose their lives is somewhere between 500,000 and uh, in excess of a million. Um, so, so the numbers are quite staggering and for, for a relatively short space of time. So the, the Rwanda genocide of 94 um, is, you know, it's, it's, it's a few months um, and it, it's, it's, it's a staggering uh, rapidity with which lives are lost uh, during this period. Um, the massacres that take place um, are using some fairly rudimentary tools. Um, machetes are probably the one, the, the implement most commonly associated uh, with this period. So it, it's it's not a, a, a technologically driven uh, episode of genocide. Um, it's not necessarily a case that the Hutus are technologically superior um, or have power in, in, in that sense of access to resources. In, 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 it's sort of it's starkly opposed to what we're seeing in Australia. Here we're dealing with a narrative of what is, from a power perspective, a minority narrative. Now, in, in the context of both Rwanda and Burundi, um, the Hutu population significantly uh, uh, significantly dwarfs uh, that of the Tutsis. The Tutsis were historically um, the voices of authority, that there had been the emergence of a power base, um, which is, as much as anything is was, was sort of historically delineated um, along the grounds of uh, power, uh, as much as anything else. Um, you know, we are dealing with distinct tribal groups that, um, or what we might describe as distinct ethnic, or we, we, we might even go so far as to say dis distinct racial groups. Um, but certainly, um, where the lines of uh, separation occur is on historical power bases. Um, so invasions historically led from a Tutsi front put them in a position of authority. They would dominate the political landscape, the cultural landscape. They would dominate decisions being made over um, economic considerations, uh, for instance. The genocide that breaks out, uh, and we'll, 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 we'll touch on some more of the, the sort of the key stepping stones uh, as, we, as we go uh, along. Um, as much as anything are based around a, a breaking point of frustrations. And in part, those frustrations can again be traced back to the impact of modernity. Um, we're thinking about industry, we're thinking about manufacturing, um, manufacturing a natural product, uh, I, I should stress, but nonetheless, um, it, it's very much a case of tracing the impact of that industrial scale of production. 
that we see as being of particular importance. Worth stressing, there are historical uh, uh, connections uh, between the leadership in Rwanda um, and uh, a European uh, scope of um, uh, interest and influence. As with much of the African continent, um, during the 19th century in particular, um, there's a heavy surge of European interest. So um, Rwanda in particular is focused by uh, both Germanic uh, and then later Belgian um, authority. But Be Belgian authority flows into uh, Burundi as well uh, for this period. Um, so we're sort of talking about that transitional point between the centuries coming towards the end of the 19th and then into the 20th century. In terms of points that we've already raised uh, in relation to Australia, this is of relevance. Um, the Tutsi leadership uh, in Rwanda is essentially uh, consolidated and strengthened by interactions with European powers. Um, connections with Germany in particular uh, mean that the uh, leadership, uh, the Tutsi leadership in Rwanda, are able to uh, draw upon Germanic military power to consolidate uh, and strengthen their position of authority within the country, but almost by uh, definition, by strengthening their positioning with the country, it's strengthening their position over the other ethnic groups that we see existing within that country, predominantly drawing attention to the Hutu narrative. I suppose worth stressing that you have a far more complex um, ethnic spread um, <coughs> throughout Rwanda, um, what we might describe as ethnic or tribal groupings, uh, are far more complex, far more numerous. Um, however, the genocide that falls down on ethnic lines <coughs> excuse me, um, is, of course, concentrated on this Hutu-Tutsi uh, division. <coughs> excuse me. The importance of that relationship between the uh, ruling authorities in Rwanda and the um, external uh, military presence and influence of European powers will manifest in relation to um, economic considerations. And we'll, we'll touch on that in just a moment. Um, just worth stressing that as we move forward through this period and you know, we, we work our way into the 20th century, identification based on um, ethnic or racial lines uh, becomes uh, a common part of the narrative. People are very clearly being delineated along these lines of Hutu, Tutsi. And you see um, on this example here, um, this, this identification card, um, clear reference point that um, uh, as to the ethnic lines that this person is not affiliated to. So we're seeing uh, Hutu Twa uh, being deleted, Tutsi and Orokoro um, highlighted as as the, the, the bloodlines or the ethnic lines that this one person was affiliated to. And as we're going through uh, much of the 20th century, that would have put this person, uh, relatively speaking, in, in a position of um, authority. Um, uh, and seniority, if you like. Um, if, if we're looking to break down the ethnic lines, I mean, the Hutu population is, well, I mean, we're talking about, I think, I think it's over 80% of the population of Rwanda. The Tutsi population uh, is less than 20. So, so you have a, a, a clear disparity in terms of uh, representation uh, and, and, and physical presence. So there was perhaps always a, a sense of fragility to Tutsi rule, um, purely on numerical grounds more than anything else. But it was a system that was um, ensured uh, and made viable as much as anything uh, by both historical grounds, uh, sort of a historical tradition of Tutsi seniority, um, or superiority is perhaps the better way of describing it. Um, that combined with the impact, uh, sorry, with the impact influence of European powers. Now, where modernity really raises its head is in relation to this theme, the the, the coffee race, if you like. Now, 
the manufacture of coffee. I, I think this is one of the papers that I've uh, given you. Um, so I've just uh, pull up the paper in front of me. Um, so this is the title um, paper titled "The Coffee." Uh, sorry, the global coffee economy and the production of genocide in Rwanda. Um, I thought this was an interesting article. I think it, it fits in with it with a lot of the um, points that we've been discussing. Um, both in relation to Australia, but it's a point that I want to bring up again in a couple of weeks' time uh, when we try to explore this narrative of, of, of to what extent is modernity responsible um, for genocide. Um, so in this article, I'm just, just thinking of trying to pull out some of the re more relevant quotes. Um, so here, um, quotation, uh, in narrating the genocide in terms of the coffee economy, I'm not arguing that an ethnicity is unimportant to understand it, nor do I dispute that ethnicity is uh, a definitive lived reality for many Rwandans. I'm suggesting rather that focusing solely on ethnicity can have the unintended effect of obscuring the important ways in which ethnicity is overdetermined within asymmetrical structured material conditions. And tied to that, it's highlighting that there is this, um, I think the, the author argues for a materiality of genocide, that if we just look at ethnic cultural lines for explanations for genocide, then we are perhaps um, narrowing our scope of understanding. Um, that we're actually making it harder for ourselves to appreciate the complexity um, of factors that lead to genocide by, by focusing or overly focusing on um, ethnic tradition, ethnic division, ethnic difference um, and conflict along those lines. We've already cited that there is this European narrative and there is a global coffee economy um, that is developing as, as we make our way through the 20th century. Now, Rwanda is, is one of a number of African uh, nations that participates in this process, um, focusing heavily on coffee as a means of developing the economy. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a competitive product. Um, it is something that there is a very clear demand for, and it's a demand that only um, increases as we go through the 20th century. So it's it's an area of growth economy. However, we have parallels with what's happening in Australia in relation to farming. Um, we could even draw parallels to things like the uh, sugar trade um, in the Caribbean in a context of colonialism uh, and slavery. Although it's not quite the same extent of narrative uh, in relation to Rwanda, there are certainly overlaps. That is to say that the Tutsis being in a position of um, symbolic, historical, political, and by virtue of association, uh, military power, were the ones who are overseeing the development of the coffee industry. They're not necessarily the ones who are engaged in the physicality of the coffee industry. They're not the ones who are doing the physical labour. Um, what they certainly are are the ones who are deriving the clearest economic benefit uh, from this process. And again, the shorthand version of this, I, I, I would encourage you to have a look through the article because it, because it is fascinating in terms of exploring the, the, the way in which economics influences um, ethnic tensions or at least contributes to it. But we clearly see a dynamic where the Hutus are the ones who are sort of put upon to do the physical labour, to conduct the hard graft work, to actually produce the coffee. The Tutsis are in a position of administration, um, overseeing things like distribution, and of course are the main beneficiaries of wealth derived from the process. There are also questions on uh, taxation that's being derived from uh, earnings and profit margins, something that the Tutsis were, um, uh, politically speaking, uh, were safeguarded from. Um, they, they weren't subject to the same uh, narrative of taxation as the Hutus were. So you have both historical grounds for uh, tension and frustration. You have ultimately an invasion-based narrative, um, the supplanting of power and authority, and the positioning of a minority people in a position of power and authority over a majority. And then that's later backed up 
with a narrative of exploitation. You know, when European powers come into Rwanda at the start of, uh, sorry, at the end of the 19th century, they're not necessarily looking to particularly change the balance of power because the balance of power works particularly well for their interests. This is this is a, a nation, or at least a proto-nation, that can be very easily exploited because the majority of the population had already been subdued. They were already... Um, they had already been subjected to forms of control that had sort of broken the spirit, that had made them subservient uh, and no longer of a mindset to challenge the authority established by the Tutsi leadership. And so from a European perspective, why change that? Why supplant a Tutsi Rwandan king who has absolute power over a majority who will work for you without question, by and large? Why change that? Well, you, you don't change that. You, you, you persist and maintain that. So you have a century plus of, I suppose, European-sponsored um, institutional, whether we would say racism um, is perhaps a point of debate, um, certainly uh, institutional um, divisions along the lines of ethnicity. And that gives you the makings of a perfect storm in terms of resentment and hostility that it might not break out at the end of the 19th century, it might not manifest through the early part to the mid part of the 20th century, but at some point you are going to have a breaking point. And the coffee manufacturing landscape is a, I would, I would contest, and I think this is argue, uh, supported by the paper that I put in front of you as well, would contest that that is a direct contributor to the factors that lead to genocide uh, as we get into the 1990s. Where we see uh, a key change uh, in the landscape of Rwanda um, is in 1961. Um, there for the first time we see a, a formal uh, conclusion to the, to, the, to the Tutsi monopoly over power in Rwanda. We see a move to a democratic system ultimately. Um, the growing resentment and hostility towards a Tutsi-led Rwandan monarchy um, is ultimately manifest in a plebiscite um, which perhaps unsurprisingly is won by the sort of the opposition side I would say the opposition side it, it, it's won by the majority Hutu population um, this brings an end to the Tutsi monarchy and brings into power, practically speaking for the first time, a Hutu president and a Hutu political leadership. The immediate consequence of that is you see a mass Tutsi uh, migration. And again, this, this perhaps shouldn't be uh, a huge surprise. You're seeing a, a very symbolic sea change of authority swinging away from what was a decades long arguably longer and deeper period of Tutsi dominance to overnight shifting to a Hutu based um, uh, body of authority. Now we do see um, a series of um, you could call them invasions or attempt to, to, to reoccupy territory uh, within Rwanda um, from uh, Tutsis who had been uh, 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 displaced by the political changes uh, that we see, um, but ultimately these are these are being forced back. They're, 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 there's no successful uh, period of invasion here, but once more it highlights the tensions that are bubbling out uh, in the immediate aftermath of this political change. But the key thing for us is as we come to the 1960s, we see Hutu political dominance established. That the Hutu um, population-based uh, dominance within Rwanda is now uh, supported by and strengthened by having the political authority over the country which um, that, that dominant ethnic group had so far uh, failed to um, influence or change. With the, with the advent of a democratic approach and the rejection of monarchy, that is now secured. Events in Rwanda escalate uh, in the direct um, aftermath of the assassination of uh, President Hariri Amani. Um, 
his plane uh, was uh, shot down. Um, at the same time, um, so sorry, 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 get my thoughts straight. Clip when when his plane was shot down, rather than um, the other way around. When his plane was shot down, he was also carrying the uh, president of Burundi as well. Now, these were both uh, Hutu uh, ethnic presidents. Um, you know, B B Burundi had only relatively recently had its first elected Hutu uh, leader, um, and Habriare Mani, Mana, sorry, um, was also Hutu, but but both of them were seen as more sort of moderate figures. Um, and in terms of the actual assassination, after years worth of investigations, it was ultimately concluded that it was from Hutu forces that the plane was actually shot down. So this was this was within the same ethnic group. Motivations for this are questionable, um, but one of the things I think we can infer from this, at the very least, um, was that there were both moderate and extremist voices within the Hutu community. Um, and those extremist voices wanted a certain, a certain course to be taken for the future of Rwanda's history. And these moderate voices um, were essentially a barrier to that. Um, uh, as we come through the early part of the 90s, the, the, in terms of not so much the relationship between the two, but the settlement between the two in terms of Hutus and Tutsis is, broadly speaking, progressive. Um, the sort of the restrictions and impositions placed upon Tutsis was being gradually rolled back. The the, the sort of the, the, the balance of power and experience seen in Rwanda um, was improving. But of course you had historically hostile voices within Rwanda who didn't want to see that uh, in the, that, that process of balance occur. Um, and you know, we could talk about this in relation to uh, by, by means of comparison, uh, Catholic emancipation. Or the or the, or the 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 lessening of restrictions against Catholics uh, in the context of the Gordon riots uh, in, in a Anglo-British setting, um, where you have large parts of London set ablaze because of hostility towards just, just the just the the loosening of restrictions against a religious group as opposed to an ethnic group. But I think that's one of the narratives that we can see here. And in the direct aftermath, we have this mass loss of life, the the uncertainty that comes with the removal of power, uh, leads to a sort of a knock-on effect of other moderate leaders being killed or removed from power, and that opens the doorway to the genocide that takes place uh, in a Rwandan context. Um, we we'll probably skip this one and, 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 and move forward to this because I, I, I'm sort of presuming you have a, a, a broader appreciation of the Rwanda genocide. It is relatively close to us in terms of time, and there's plenty of additional literature that I can put your way if you feel like you you, you need to um, follow up on this particular um, period of Rwandan history in the early 1990s. Worth stressing that in the aftermath, I mean, this, this is a remarkable picture of um, a Tutsi woman whose husband was murdered by the man standing next to her, um, her Hutu neighbour. And, you know, the, the way in which the genocide plays out, it's, it's, it's quite instantaneous, it's rapid, it's people literally turning on their neighbours, their, their colleagues, people who they might even have called friends prior to the point that the genocide breaks out. There was this sort of this, this frenzy um, that breaks out. You, you see descriptions of um, predominantly Hutu males um, butchering during the course of the day, celebrating what they had done during the night, drinking heavily during the night, and then starting the whole process uh, again the following day. And as I, I think I stressed a little bit earlier on, um, we see this both in relation to um, Tutsis being killed, but also Hutus that were protecting um, Tutsis. There have been efforts at reconciliation, and there are these reconciliatory villages that have been established where um, uh, perpetrators of crimes have been notionally reintegrated into communities where Tutsi families, what's left of them, um, 
are, are living today. Uh, and in some instances there are suggestions this is quite going quite well, other instances to suggest that this is quite a forced um, and um, a forced relationship, uh, one with questionable uh, sincerity underpinning it. But, but nonetheless, uh, the, 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 this is sort of part of the aftermath uh, narrative. We touched on the idea of um, mental health in relation to Australia, that, that within the context of aftermath we know in relation to genocides, and this is perhaps very clearly illustrated in a Rwandan context, that um, there are many people, many survivors, um, who suffer from profound uh, mental health challenges, and this is not surprising in any way at all, but it's an important detail to add into our discussion to further highlight that this is not, um, the experience of genocide is not tied to the moment, that there is an emotional legacy that runs on for survivors uh, and indeed um, uh, following generations who live with a sense of anger, guilt, uh, responsibility and so forth and this this might be something we'll uh, give voice to in relation to the Holocaust narrative as well. So there are a number of different things to take from the Rwandan genocide and I, I don't want to be seen to be overstating the importance of the coffee-based economy but it is a clear contributor um, to exacerbating or reinforcing um, the, that sense of hostility and resentment between ethnic groups. It feeds the, the, the fire of um, resentment that is clearly developing over many decades. Um, obviously there are other factors at play and the ethnic tensions are, are, are ultimately the, the, the key trigger. Um, but that's the product again of decades worth of conditioning um, to which the relationship with uh, European colonial powers and the relationship to a mass international um, consumer-driven market has, has a direct contribution to. So um, these are points on modernity that I, I do want you to be conscious of uh, and hold on to as we go through these sessions. One of the other things I wanted to talk to, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to go through these relatively quickly, um, uh, more than anything, I started recording this on Wednesday, and because of one factor or another, it's now Friday. Um, so I do want to get this out to you as soon as possible. Um, ultimately, what we are dealing with is uh, a process of otherness. Um, in the Rwandan narrative, otherness is very clear. Um, a process of othering directed towards the Tutsis based on historical tensions is very clearly illustrated in the context of Australia whilst otherness is not where the process begins um, we certainly see a process of otherness uh, manifest towards the end of that cycle we, we, we touched on the point at the mid 19th century point where newspapers were advocating um, eugenics so, so that's very clearly a, an evolution of that process othering is a critical component to genocide and mass murder. Othering is uh, it is more a philosophical set of reflections on the way in which humans interact, sorry, interact, but it is a process by which um, communities identify how other communities are distinct. But within that discussion you often get a sense of why other communities are dangerous or subversive, ultimately negative forces. And once you start having that conversation, more often than not, a conversation that follows is what do you do about that negative external force? Do you ignore it? Do you participate with it? Do you try to educate it? Or do you try to eradicate it? And certainly throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, there are plenty of illustrations of the process of eradication. Now, at this point, I, I stress on the slide, at this point we'll be having a discussion about the process of othering, and I would like you to pause the recording uh, for a moment, and again, just, just sort of jot down some ideas and notes um, on this question. I want you to think about how people, communities and cultures are othered 
and question why is that process of such importance? Now I've already alluded to the fact that othering can lead to killing. If you define others as a threat and justify it to yourself and indeed others within your community, it's not that many steps until you are justifying attacking, killing, removing, eradicating those other threats. So at this point, I would like you to just just stop and do, don't let me lead you and just come up to come up with some of your own ideas as to how this process of othering uh, takes place. Okay, so hopefully you've had an opportunity to uh, jot down some of your own ideas on this process of othering. I just want to give you a handful of examples uh, to think about, some of which uh, are themes you may well have come up uh, with in your own, uh, in your own time. Um, propaganda is one of the classic forms uh, of othering, or one of the classic ways in which othering is uh, manifest. Um, just some classic images here dealing with US propaganda against the Japanese um, in the early part of the 1940s. Um, we could have a discussion or a debate about whether whether the events that take place in Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, constitute uh, genocide. Um, there are lots of scholars of genocide who would contest that it does not, um, yet there are elements of what takes place in those two cities uh, that might allow for at least a, at least a debate on that point. Um, but here you have uh, you know just the classic elements of othering. Um, here we, we're based on uh, facial features, stereotyping, um, critiques on uh, culture and tradition as as a negative element. Um, we could be doing the exact same thing with treatment of Jewish people in relation to uh, Germany and Central Europe more generally, um, but unsurprisingly we'll, we'll, we'll do a little bit more on that um, in relation to the next session uh, on, uh, on the Holocaust specifically. Um, but this sort of process is active, you know, I mean, certainly from the 19th century, uh, where again the stereotyping of people on the grounds of uh, cultural, ethnic or national stereotypes um, becomes uh, very well uh, established. But some of those other features that are familiar to us, um, religion. So I've already mentioned the Gordon Riots, and this is a depiction of the Gordon Riots. Um, you'll see in this depiction here um, lots of references to no popery. Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier that the, um, the Gordon Riots were notionally um, focused on um, hostility towards um, not so much hostility towards Catholics but hostility towards um, a loosening of restrictions against Catholics. And so this is playing out in 1780. Um, the riots take their name from uh, Lord George Gordon, um, uh, hence the Gordon riots. Um, he's a, a vocal critique, um, sorry, a vocal critic um, of uh, the loosening of restrictions against Catholicism. And the, 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 the shorthand version of this is there is wide-scale violent protest um, breaking out in relation to this, this loosening of restrictions. You see the Bank of England attacked. Um, you see um, Newgate Jail burned to the ground. Um, gin distilleries are set fire to and explode, causing wide-scale destruction um, across uh, a significant part of the city. And this is all tied up with religious-based distinctions. Now, the Gordon Riots are more complex than that. I'm not going to sit here and, and try and argue that the Gordon Riots were exclusively about religious difference. They weren't. There were a lot of other social factors at play. However, there is an undeniable role played by religious othering that acts as a starting point towards this hostility, that, and that, that acts as sort of a gateway through which other forms of um, resentment might be expressed. And it's worth saying that many of the private homes that are attacked uh, and destroyed are the homes of Catholics. Uh, and numerous places of uh, Catholic worship are attacked and destroyed. Um, so it's like uh, places of religious worship tied to uh, foreign institutions, foreign embassies, uh, for instance are a focal point for hostility. So there is a very clear um, uh, manifestation of uh, violence towards those of a different religious persuasion. And it just highlights to us um, 
the cultural distinctions uh, that we're having to deal with. Um, so religion certainly stands out as, as a clear point. Um, something else that we've we've touched on that we that we've I suppose draw reference to last week is language. Um, you know, we talked about language in relation to Ireland and the notion of cultural genocide. This is a little bit different. So, you know, re revisiting the, the, the same sort of um, US based propaganda. Um, and here it's just once more highlighting difference. Um, it's not necessarily saying that the language itself is a problem, but it's using it as a means of reinforcing why these people are different to you. And almost by almost by the definition within these um, images, within these pieces of propaganda, um, the threat of the other is highlighted by the very fact they speak something different. And you know, the, the, this language here: don't speak the enemy's language, speak American. This creates a sense of solidarity within the community, within the American community. You know, whatever American is as a language, you're being compelled to speak it. Anybody who's not subscribing to that is subscribing to the enemy's narrative. So this also demonizes the other by being different and nothing more than that. But it's also creating a hostile environment within the nation. And of course, we know quite well um, that Japanese or like former Japanese nationals who had relocated, who migrated to North America, made the United States their home, uh, were subject to extreme forms of uh, restrictive measures during the Second World War um, on grounds of race, culture, um, language, those points of difference, those points of othering. Um, so those speaking a different language are very easily identified as the other, as something distinct, and by virtue of that, something that should not be trusted. And, oh, sorry, the, the final thing I wanted to throw into the mix was the theme of race. Um, and we're going to be obviously talking more about this um, in, in next week's session on the Holocaust. Um, here we, we're again dealing with US-based propaganda, um, but this is dealing with hostility towards uh, Chinese uh, migration uh, into the United States. Um, you can see from the date we're dealing with the late 19th century here. Um, but it's interesting that, 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 that there's a lot of narrative here which actually overlaps with the anti-Semitic texts that appear in the 1930s and 1940s in Germany as well. Um, a sort of threat to children, um, uh, thievery, um, uh, the harassing of women in their homes. Um, these are all sorts of points that are consistent uh, with treatment of Jewish people within Nazi propaganda and I suppose uh, also Nazi satire. Uh, but this is very much what we're dealing with here. Th th these are all images uh, from the WASP publication, uh, a San Francisco based uh, uh, journal uh, which was overt in its hostility towards um, uh, Chinese migration. Um, and again, perhaps some of these images may have uh, familiar or may, may have a familiar feel to them in relation to narratives about migration into a British or European setting in a contemporary context. But here, once again, Chinese migration is presented as a threat. But why, why is this narrative of danger? Well, the, the main danger here it's not so much the numbers, but the point of difference. You know, we're, we're again dealing with uh, visual and racial stereotyping here, um, which presents the Chinese figure as threat, as danger. And the main reason for that is because of a point of difference. And this is continued in images such as this, um, which reinforces the threat of the Chinese migration, but also points to Irish migration uh, as a threat as, as well. And here we see uh, Uncle Sam literally being consumed by foreign migrants. Um, again, there's nothing really to quantify what the threat is, but the key thing here is the point of difference, the point of distinction. Um, the foreigner is different, and the very fact they are different makes them a threat. And this process of othering, I mean, we can see it in lots of other cultural contexts as well. Um, 
these are the, this is just a slide that I use with my third year students um, talking about um, attitudes towards race uh, in Italy. Um, always worth being aware that, that racial policy in Italy doesn't come until quite late within the period of fascism, excuse me, quite late in the period of Italian fascism. Um, but when it does um, ultimately adopt Nazi philosophy on race, it's highly um, overt. Um, and here, you know, just some classic images left and right of this panel are perhaps most representative of the process that we're dealing with. On the left, we have the image, the, the sort of the classical image in the background um, of the sort of the, the pure, pristine, classical um, Roman figure. The gladius cleaves between the classical figure and the Jewish figure and the African figure um, in the foreground. They're presented as different based on physical traits, physical stereotyping. On the right hand side, a conflation again, the black mark smudge is seen to be a narrative of race in relation to African migration, the Star of David, an obvious reference to, to uh, Judaism. Um, and it's, it's here marked as almost corrupting the, the, the pure classical art forms seen uh, coming out of Italy. Um, the central point, this, this, this hand uh, clutching at the Star of David with this head of vipers at the top. Um, of course, this is still feeding into the process of othering, but it's, it, it's slightly more abstract. I think we see othering very clearly on the left and right of, of this particular panel. Um, the text, uh, Difesa della Raza, uh, essentially in, in, in defense of the race and the race here being the white Italian race. So, so you don't have to dig deep to, to find these points of othering. Um, and this, this is far from the only grounds through which othering is constructed, but they are perhaps some of the more obvious uh, narratives. And one of the things I want to uh, end on is a consideration of nationalism. The process of othering is perhaps most clearly illustrated in the context of nationalism. But here, you know, I'm taking a fairly provocative contemporary uh, satire here dealing with uh, uh, British and European Union hostilities, um, much of which uh, is grounded along the lines of nationalism. Um, however, nationalism itself, and I, I, I'm only going to talk very, very briefly about this because we do have a specific second year module on nationalism, so, so I, I don't want to be going into too much stuff that's repeated later. Um, but it's just to draw attention to the fact that othering as a process is really, uh, really develops hand in hand with the emergence of nationalism. So again, shorthand version, we can say that nationalism really begins to take form um, in the wake of the French Revolution. So, so, so we're coming out of the 18th into the 19th century. And then we have a, a, this long 19th century in which nationalism really takes form. And this is a process when for the first time nations really begin to define themselves along national lines. That is to say it's opposed to nations uh, being preoccupied with uh, the monarchs who were in charge of those nations. The focus shifts away from monarchs to an idea of nation, to an idea of a people uh, unified along certain traits. So. Uh, again, very much coming out of the French Revolution, we see um, a, a sort of a process of internal stereotyping in the sense of uh, national communities begin to try to define what makes them distinct from neighbours beyond. And once you engage in that process of saying we are different along these grounds, it's very difficult for hostility and tension to emerge because often value-based judgments come into that discussion where you start to say, well, we do this this way, or we do things that way, and that's different from the people over there, and we don't like the way they're doing things over there. There's something untrustworthy, there's something backwards, subversive, dangerous about the way they do things over there, and the way that we do things here is the right way. It's the correct way, it's the ethical way, it's the moral way, whatever, however you want to frame it. And that potentially moral way needs to be safeguarded. So much of the expansion of French territory in the wake of the immediate stage of the French Revolution was an idea of sort of safeguarding French interests from foreign threats. Foreign threats that were different for a number of cultural uh, points of delineation. 
and that's really where hostilities begin to develop. Um, just some images dealing with uh, Christmas narratives uh, uh, going into a, a, a sort of a pre-war and then into the First World War period. Um, again, using national stereotypes. Here, John Bull. John, John Bull is sort of the Uncle Sam character of uh, British satire through um, 18th and 19th centuries, just sort of creeping into the start of the 20th before he's sort of replaced by the bulldog. Um, but here we have John Bull defending uh, the old plum pudding, which again is synonymous with um, British identity. So we get these identity measures or markers that then become used as forms of defiance. The Kaiser gets his Christmas pudding or his plum pudding fired directly to him through a cannon. So these points of difference but also points of national identity and national unity become sort of physical manifestations of ways in which you can defend your identity, your culture um, in defiance of that which may be on your doorstep. Um, and just finally, um, just to sort of reinforce uh, the way in which this process works. Sorry, this is not quite centered. Um, I wonder if I can make this a little bit bigger for you um, or smaller. No, it's not quite going to work. Oh, there we go. That's what I wanted to do. Um, here, again, uh, another wonderful piece of propaganda emphasizing the importance of the Christmas or plum pudding. But here it's it's highlighting dominion. Um, how is the Christmas pudding made? Canadian flour, Australian South African raisins, Australian sultanas, uh, demerara sugar from the colonies, a bit of English or Scottish suet beef, um, wine glass full of Jamaican rum, spice from India. It's, it's, it's a narrative of colonialism um, at the bottom. Um, You'll enjoy it all the more if you remember by, by using empire fruit to make it, you give a helping hand to the thousands of British settlers overseas. Um, these, these symbols become both unifying internally and externally. They become a point of reference for those who migrate to other places and then they can hold on to those narratives. Almost like the sort of the, 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 the classic narrative of the English pub in Spain, that there is a, a, a colonialism uh, tied to migration which implants these cultural traits into those landscapes um, so it's really quite striking um, how this process begins and again I, I don't want to be too glib about this I'm, I'm not putting these um, points these final slides in um, uh, to, to in any way be light-hearted um, these are contributory factors to the process of genocide. Genocide starts with othering. Genocide doesn't just happen overnight. It is a long drawn out process that runs over decades if not even centuries and reaches a critical mass point. But that critical mass point is born out of this process of othering that runs much much deeper. And these satires are contributory factors to that. Satires that both give a sense of what is your cultural identity internally, but then also highlighting what is different and distinct about others outside of uh, that community-based narrative. That's something that I want to pick up with next week. I'm hoping that I'll be able to speak with you uh, in person um, on Monday, or at least uh, to, to run the session live on Monday. We'll see how things go. Um, you know, things have been a bit up and down. It's taken me several days to, to, to record what I have. So so I apologise in a sense. At, at the point of me stopping this recording, I can't tell you exactly uh, how long this recording is because, because the recording has been quite interrupted. Um, but what I hope you will take from this um, is, I suppose, uh, like three key points. One, one of which is about recognising the process of othering and how that feeds into a system of genocide. It's also critical to acknowledge where modernity fits into the narrative. Um, modernity manifests through um, mass markets, 
through international trade, through the movement of goods and who's regulating those goods. Where, where is that demand being met and facilitated? More often than not, the, 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 the demands of the mass market in one part of the world are being met by suppliers in a different part of the world, often a part of the world that is far easier to exploit, far easier to take advantage of, or indeed far easier to control. This is one of the ways in which the modern world, in which modernity feeds into the process of genocide. And I'll, okay, I'll send, sorry, and again, I'll say once more, just, just, to, just to sort of round things off. Um, this is not to say that modernity is, you know, directly responsible for, say, the genocide in Rwanda, or directly responsible for what we might explore as the genocide of the Aborigines in Australia. But it is definitively a contributory factor to it. And that's something that we can't ignore and have to be conscious of as we look at some of our other case studies. So where we move next is Germany, the Holocaust and the surrounding uh, nations and experiences of people uh, around uh, that period of history and that geography. Okay, on that, I'll bring it to an end. Um, again, I apologise I wasn't able to deliver this to you live. Uh, hopefully it's given you some interesting ideas to take on. Do have a look at the reading. I think there are some fascinating articles which I'm hoping um, will really help you uh, challenge some preconceptions about genocide and where genocide comes from uh, as a process. But I'm on that. I'll stop the recording now. I'll start processing it. Um, you know, I'm stopping recording at about quarter past two on Friday, um, days later than I, I, I hope to do. Uh, my, my, my apologies for that. Um, there have been more hospital appointments between me starting this recording and finishing it. Um, so I'll upload this uh, now. It'll take several hours to process. I apologize for that. But but hopefully at least by b b before the end of the day on Friday, you'll have access to this. Uh, and hopefully you'll get a chance over the weekend to, to, to work through this sort of at your leisure. But um Many thanks if you do manage to work through the recording. I, I appreciate you taking the time uh, and hopefully we'll see you one way or another uh, in, the coming, in the coming weeks. Okay, many thanks all. Uh, we'll be in touch soon.